Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's session of the CBS Leadership Speaker Series. I hope wherever you're logging in from, you are safe and making the very best of this summer. My name is Naomi Bowie. I'm a member of the class of 2021 here at Columbia Business School, and I'm also the co-president of the Black Business Students Association. It is my pleasure to officially welcome my fellow students, faculty members, staff, and esteemed panelists this evening. The CBS Leadership Speaker Series was established to offer students to access to those at the very center of business, giving us an unparalleled opportunity to learn from CEOs, founders, and distinguished business leaders. Tonight, we will hear from Dee McGuarris, Matteo DeVecchio, class of 2008, and Terry Lundgren. After an introduction of our panelists by Dee McGuarris, Matteo DeVecchio will lead Terry Lundgren in conversation in his, through about his uh, professional experience in the retail industry. I'm especially excited to hear from Matteo and Terry as I have had the pleasure of working in the buying and planning functions at Bloomingdale's during Terry's tenure as, as CEO. Guests will then have a chance to participate in a live Q&A session. Please use the raise your hand function to signal that you have a question. When it's your turn to speak, we will turn on your video and microphone so that you can interact uh, face to face with the speakers. If you prefer to ask your question via the Q&A button, please do so during the conversation and we'll get to those as well. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Costis Maglaris, the, D, the David and Lynn Sintel Professor of Business here at the Business School. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, all of us, for joining us, for welcoming uh, uh, our two panelists. Uh, and Naomi, thank you for your leadership of the BBSA, which is crucially important at the school. I'm going to keep my remarks extremely brief uh, uh, because I'm actually looking forward to the discussion between uh, Terry Langren and Matteo Del Vecchio. Uh, Terry served as 14 years, as many of you know, as CEO of Macy's. Uh, and Macy's is the umbrella company for Macy's, Bloomingdale, Blue Mercury, and really one of the largest uh, retail e commerce businesses in America. And uh, Terry retired a couple of years ago. Uh, and, uh, but before that, he, you know, he had a long career that started, I guess, with merchandising. He was president and chief merchandising officer, uh, before he became CEO, uh, in 2004. I remember, uh, the time that, uh, during, uh, Terry's, uh, leadership at Macy's, he, uh, they made, uh, uh, the acquisition of May department stores and, and nearly doubled the size of the company then renamed uh, all of the stores to have the Macy's uh, name and really created a, na a, national way, a nationwide brand and uh, the largest fashion retail company uh, in the country. Uh, in his years, uh, sales uh, approached $26 million billion. Uh, he had approximately 140,000 employees and the company was really an icon. Uh, both in New York, of course, uh, as we know, but uh, throughout the country. It operated throughout, uh, in, in most of the states, I guess 45 states, uh, District of Columbia, Guam, from what I see now, Puerto Rico. Uh, I also had a close relationship mostly with the Bloomingdale's and the dot-com portions of the company that were uh, very innovative throughout the last two decades. Uh, Terry sits on the board of Procter & Gamble, uh, and he was a former board member of Kraft and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And Terry uh, is a close friend of the school. He serves as an executive in residence here at Columbia Business School. Uh, and uh, Terry, very, very warm welcome for you uh, in this evening. Together joining Terry is... Uh, Matteo Del Vecchio. Matteo graduated from the business school in 2008, and he's now chief executive officer of Brooks Brothers uh, jewelry division called the Connect Group. Uh, Matteo began his career at Brooks Brothers in 2012, and prior to his role, uh, Matteo was chief administrative officer of Brooks Brothers uh, Group. Uh, before that, he started at Goldman Sachs in investment banking in the financial in the FIG Group, the Financial Institutions Group. Uh, in New York and Sao Paulo, Brazil, and prior to that, uh, he was at McKinsey in Milan. So both Terry and Matteo are uh, closely connected to the school through another area, the Deming Center uh, for Quality and Productivity and Competitiveness. Terry, of course, was one of the winners of the Deming Cup uh, in 2012, and he's co-chair of the Deming Cup Judging Committee. Uh, and uh, he has been involved uh, with the Deming Center 
for a very, very long time. And we really appreciate uh, everything that you do there. And Matteo has been also deeply involved with the center for the number of years. And now he's part of a member of our advisory uh, board. So thank you very much uh, also for everything that you do for the school and the Demic Center. So now I'm gonna stop talking and I truly look forward to listening about everything that the two of you have to share, uh, including uh, what's going on in retail in these days. So Matteo and Terry, uh, take it on. Thank you. Well, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean Maglaris, uh, and good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure and an honor to be part uh, of this uh, conversation with uh, Terry. Uh, Terry has been a great role model for all of us in the retail industry. And uh, I really look forward to be able to change a couple of questions as what, what's it going to be for our industry? What's it going to be for retail uh, post COVID? So I think uh, uh, all of us are really thinking what's going to change? What's going to be the future? We all hear the headlines on the newspapers of, of some of the challenges that us retailers are facing in, in adapting to the new environment. So I'd like to kick it off with a million dollar question, but uh, I would like to ask Terry what he thinks. Are customers gonna come back to stores? <laughs> thank you uh, for the question, Matteo. Thank you, Dean McGlaris, and uh, thank you, uh, Naomi, for, for the introduction. Um, the answer is yes, uh, but let me, let me give you uh, a, a more specific answer to your, your question, Matteo. So, so uh, I want to start off by just putting some facts down. Uh, number one is, is that, and Matteo knows this very well, online retailing, which has been, of course, powerful engine driving total retail sales for the last several years, still before COVID-19. So February 2020 represented, in all of 2019, represented 13% of total sales. So most people think it's 50, 60%. It's 13% of total sales, still a very big number. And Amazon, of course, you see packages being delivered around your neighborhood every day, has about half of that business. So they are the substantial leader in that, in, in that category. But that still means that 87% of the business was being done in physical stores and uh, prior to the, prior to, uh, the COVID-19 experience. Now, obviously we've all become much more comfortable ordering online because we haven't really had much of a choice to do otherwise. So, so we've ramped up significantly the activity we do do online. And I think, Mateo, that is going to stick. I think, I think that, that customers, consumers are going to be more and more comfortable with ordering food online as they've been doing. They never ordered food online. I mean, if food was 2% penetration in the past. Beauty was 10% penetration in the past. Apparel was maybe 30, 30%. Maybe, you know, books and books and, and, and music was 85. So it was very, really varied by, by category. Well, now everything's been exposed to online purchasing. We've gotten comfortable with, with uh, buying that way. I think that's going to stick in terms of uh, its, its growth and its penetration. However, at a, let's just say instead of growing 10%, like it's grown for the last five years, it doubles, which would be a huge move for online penetration. And it gets to 25, 26% of the business. That still leaves set three quarters of the business to be done in the physical stores for the, the near term, certainly. So, so that's my sense, that's my, that's my prediction. That'd be a huge lift for online sales in terms of percent to total sales, but people will return to stores for all the reasons Mateo and, and I and Naomi and others who have worked in retail know, and that is the satisfaction of that physical experience with a professional telling you, this, is look, this looks good for, on you, this is the right shoe to go with that, that dress, that physical interaction and experience is hard still to replace online. We're doing that, attempting to do that, but still I, I, I believe that that will, con that will continue to be the primary way people will buy product, meaning the majority, for the foreseeable future. I agree with you, Terry, and I'd like to add, I think all of us remember that amazing interaction that we had in the store with that great sales associate that really made you feel great and helped you uh, choose something that was perfect for you. Uh, all of us, I think, enjoyed that moment and, and really wanted to and look forward to interacting with, with that person. So I think that, you know, 
that relationship aspect is going to be fundamental. And at the end, we're, we're all human. We love to have relationships and, and, and hang out with other people. So uh, I, I think that's still going to be very valuable uh, going forward. Agree. I agree. And I want to say something at the beginning, too, for, 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 the, for the male students who are on the, 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 the call tonight, and you're scratching your head and saying, hey, that's not me. That's not how, how I shop. That's okay, and that's, that's, uh, that's understandable because what we're talking about is the majority of customers, and by far, no offense, but major, large, large majority of the total retail business is, is driven by female consumers, and uh, that could, female consumer shops very differently. On average, not everybody's the same, but on average, that female consumer shops differently and likes this social interaction, likes to choose and be in charge of all the options that they're seeing as opposed to just coming in for the kill of the item and taking it out and leaving immediately. So, so there is difference in shopping, shopping be behavior. And thank goodness, uh, at least in, in my former uh, experience, that women were making those decisions because they were buying basically 80% of, uh, of the products being sold in Macy's, Bloomingdale's, and even more so in uh, Blue Mercury. That, that's really interesting. And I think another question, Terry, that, that, that now, nowadays is very relevant is, what customers are going to base their buying decisions upon. We're hearing more and more that uh, uh, brand affiliations and, and, and brand social values are becoming more and more of a decision maker for customers as they choose which brands to engage with and what products to choose. So what do you think? Is that going to change even further in the future? How, how will people think about this? I think it's a I think it's a very good good question. I have a couple of things to to say about it. So so you know the brand affiliation, the brand association is very valuable. And so the the interaction, the impact that you have uh, with the consumer um, during that interaction is, has a lasting uh, impact on uh, the future decisions for choosing that that store, that retail, that brand to shop with in the, in the future. And it has to do with the actual experience. It has to do with the product. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, the uniqueness of the product, I think, Matteo, is, is incredibly valuable. And that's been lost a little bit uh, in the, during the last five months in particular. People will buy what they can and what they can get their hands on, particularly if you were looking for uh, toilet paper or you were looking for, uh, you know, a, a washing towels, you know, it, they, you got whatever you could take because it was whatever was available. I think as time you know, goes on, people will go back to wanting the product that's right for them. And ultimately it's about that. Um, there will be other influencers about why they choose a brand, why they choose a, a, a retail company to, to shop with. I think the uniqueness part is a really very, very important. So that by that, I mean, Brooks Brothers has Brooks Brothers product. Uh, Macy's had the Inc. brand as an example. Bloomingdale's had the Aqua brand. These were exclusive products that were being made specifically, specifically for the target customer. And you couldn't find it elsewhere. You couldn't find it online somewhere else. And so you didn't have to worry or wonder if someone else for that particular day was going to sell it for $5 cheaper than you were selling it for that particular day. And so I think that you, the, the consumer wants product that's unique and that is, is perhaps more limited in the distribution. Uh, and obviously they'll, they want to feel good about the purchase. And that comes from reinforcement by others saying how good you look in that particular outfit product or what a good decision you made in purchasing that product. So I think that uniqueness is, is key. And then back to your specific point, you know, will, will, will so the social influences matter ultimately? And I can tell you that having been in this business for a long, long time, I do see that finally shifting. For years, I had consumers say to me, you know, I, I will only buy this product if it's made in America. I will only buy this, this product if it's made of 100% natural fibers. And I, you know, they would say these things and I'd say, oh, well, okay. So this is gonna cost you another $5, is that okay? Oh, no, no, you can't charge me another $5. It has to be you know, the same price as the one that looks like it, but it was made you know, in, in somewhere else. And, and ultimately the value became 
the driver when all of the decisions were laid out on the table. They had to have good value with that, with that product. And consumers were not willing to pay more for that extra layer of quality. I'm talking about the majority of customers. Certainly the super high-end co consumer wants nothing but the best and they'll pay for that. But for the majority of customers, they wanted value. I, str I strongly feel that that shift toward the particular particular this, the, the, the Gen Z co consumer, but also the, the, the millennial consumer as well, have said, I also want to know what this company stands for. I want to know what this product is made out of. I want to know what their social responsibility standards are. And so I do think that for the first time, it just in, in, in this over the last 30 years, I think in the, this year going into the next five to 10 years, it's going to actually make a difference in how consumers decide who they're going to buy from, what brands they're going to purchase from. And that's going to have to also be, you're going to have to also satisfy their, their wishes for being a socially responsible company. Yeah, I think in a conversation I had with my friends and then and some of them, some of my younger friends, this is becoming more and more important. I hear it so many times, okay, but I really believe in this brand. They believe in like the causes that I feel very close to, whether that is sustainability or another social cause. Uh, many people I hear, they're really taking into consideration these elements just beyond the pure value of the product. And I think that's gonna become more and more important uh, going forward. We see some of these brands that are really making this uh, values are a main aspect of what they're bringing forward, whether it's a charitable aspect or a social aspect, and we've seen them being quite successful uh, based on this. I agree with you, and, 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 I, and I think, you know, it always comes down to, you know, uh, if, if you're willing to put your, your, your purchase power behind your beliefs, then you can change. You can make changes at companies, at brands. And, and if you truly will buy products because of all of these things we've just discussed, you know, your, your social position on the environment and, and on, the, on the materials you're using and the countries you're sourcing from and the, the, the labor laws and all those things. If you, pur if you purposely put your, your buying power behind those subjects, the companies will absolutely change in response to those demands. And that's how it works. It, it, you know, if you, you can say it and then you don't, you don't, don't buy anything, nothing happens. So, so it's really the, the, the power of the, of the purchasing behavior uh, of this, this, uh, this younger generation, I think will actually make these material changes known, required by, by these uh, brands and, and retailers. And they, in fact, will respond. Absolutely. At the end, people vote with their wallets. It exactly. makes a huge difference. Exactly. Okay, I think another question that I wanted to ask you, Terry, that I think is very relevant for many of the people that are listening, that are interested in the retail. COVID obviously is gonna be a huge transformation of the way we do shopping, on how we interact and choose the products that we want to purchase. Is it gonna change also what type of categories of products are really gonna be more important or less for us going forward? Obviously, there's been like a, a, an emphasis over the last few months over products for the home. People are really enjoying the time home, the time with their families. And so there's been a resurgence of products that have to do with, with home environment. So I'd like to get your thoughts there on how you can foresee the dynamics among different categories as we go forward and we recover post COVID. Right. Well, this is, of course, again, is a million dollar question, right? What are, will people buy and how do we get in front of those trends? Um, but, but clearly, we've all been spending more time at home and we're discovering more things at home. We're discovering that we either like what we have around us or we want to change what we have uh, around us. And that includes everything from the chairs that we sit in to the computer that we use to the, uh, to the kitchen you know, utensils that were and, and, and cookware that we're, we're using. So I think home furnishings, it's already beginning to see the benefits of time spent at home, the growth in home furnishings. I believe that will continue as everything from furniture to uh, coffee pots to, uh, to decorative uh, pillows, accessories and bedding and the like. So I think that's, uh, that's one. I think all of your, your offices have, your home offices have a, uh, 
a new standard uh, today. And so, so since we're spending more time there, we've discovered all the things that are wrong with those uh, home offices and there's upgrades that are taking place there. Our Wi-Fi systems are, are all seem to need upgrading now because whatever worked before was fine, but there wasn't nearly as much demand in the past. Now everybody's on the system at the same time and there's, there's, there's upgrades required. I also think that that uh, you know, in the apparel, the apparel side, I think the only thing that's selling now is athletic wear and athleisure wear. And for those of you who don't know what athleisure wear is, it's that it's basically looks like athletic wear, but you have no intention of, of doing anything physical or breaking a sweat, but you want to look like you are. So those two categories are 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 selling uh, selling pretty briskly, but unfortunately, those are the lower ticket items and things like you know suits. Like for the first time, Mateo, thank you for dressing up. Um, you know, I spent my my career trying to sell you know suits and neckwear and uh, and and uh, and uh, high quality uh, men's apparel and 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 frankly, I, you're the first uh, sport coat that I've seen in in quite some time. So I'm uh, I'm, I'm actually encouraged by your advertising for that that product, but I'm not so sure it's going to have a long lasting impact. Uh, it is uh, uh, there aren't any events, so so a lot of a lot of purchases for apparel are driven by events. And since you're not going to, most people are not going to to work and and uh, wanting needing to to change their look every day. Most people are not going to. No, no one's going to these uh, events or parties or or fancy restaurants or the like. Those are all event activities, weddings that you get. You buy purchases to dress for, and those those reasons are gone for the moment and for the, for the foreseeable months ahead. So I think that's the negative side of what's uh, what's what what is uh, not going to be selling here. From, I'm sorry sorry to say for you and and and, and for my form, parts of my former company, um, but I think that you know there's a there's a lot of activities around games and there's a lot of activities around both electronic games. Um, and uh, and around uh, board games and, and and the like, you can find these categories that um, are are activities that are actually bringing people together in a different way, socializing in a in a different way uh, that are, are are starting to trend and starting to see movement. Uh, in fact, being sold out in in certain stores. And I think you know the cleaning subject we talked a little bit about. I think that changes permanently. I think uh, that's that's not going to be a short-term trend. I, th I think people are going to wash their hands more often. I think people are going to clean their surfaces more often. I think people are going to wash their laundry more often. I'm on the board, um, as Dean uh, suggested, of uh, Procter and Gamble, and so we have Tide and and we we have Bounty and and uh, and, and many products that were have sold extremely well. And they just finished an extraordinarily strong you know year and qu last quarter again and, and and year because of all the product categories that that they sell. And you can see the the trends there. By the way, Mateo, you're an example of one of the poor poor uh, selling trends that Procter and Gamble has, and it's called Gillette razors. <laughs> That's the category that's not selling so well uh, for for obvious reasons, and people are people are uh, are taking this this uh, this time to to grow out both their their hair and their and their and their facial hair if if you can, unlike me, but if you can, and uh, and so that's the category is not selling, but but the cleaning materials have continued to sell um, and continue to 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 have very robust robust performance and i think that's a, a trend that that's it's going to going to stick and uh, and continue well terry i'm a little bit biased but i wanted to suggest that sport coats are great for video video calls they're yeah. really cool and uh, they, they make you look great so i highly encourage that uh, people can try that out absolutely and you do look great i <laughs> applaud you for the advertising okay uh, Another question, I think, as we think that uh, uh, going back, uh, right now we're all, most of us are working from home and we really discovered a, a new way of, uh, of working, a new way of engaging with our colleagues and, and, and getting things done. And I think early studies have demonstrated that productivity actually has kept up very well in this uh, virtual working environment. My question is, what do you think, Terry? Is this going to continue? Are we going to go back working in a physical environment? What are we going to learn from this situation and how are we going to apply that going forward? 
Yeah, I've spent uh, a lot of time thinking about this subject because, you know, from a company's standpoint, from a CEO's perspective, just think of all the money you could save if you didn't have to have office space. You know, you think about, wow, I'm going to save on rent. I'm going to save on all the food that they eat at the, at the office, all the water they drink in the, in the building. I'm going to save on, uh, on, 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 on all the uh, utility costs that I, that I spend, the phone costs. And so you think about all of the, the, the advantages cost-wise for companies to say, let's continue to, uh, to, to work from home. And as, as we know now, I think Facebook and Google and Uber have all taken a position and, and said they're going to delay coming back to the offices for, for some time. I think Google said summer of 21 is, is, a, is a new forecast for coming back to the office. So they are, to your point, finding ways to work efficiently from home. Having said that, my real world experience, and I have a network of uh, friends and CEOs uh, that, I, that I stay in touch with, uh, and doing my own survey with them, most of them argue that there's a balance that's going to take place in the future uh, because they, they definitely want people back into the office they definitely believe that true innovation takes place when there's face-to-face -face interaction and brainstorming, uh, and, and that's done with human contact. And so there's a there's a there's a desire to bring that back uh, to a common space, but perhaps to do so in waves. And so some have said they're considering you know Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for one group, and then a and then group B. We'll work, you know, Thursday, Friday, Thursday, Friday, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, or Saturday if that's a, an optional day, and just try to work out the office space that way. So you'd have shared desk and shared space, um, but they could still could be would be able to reduce their their office uh, their office space, and have to keep in mind that the space for the near term anyway is going to be significantly different and, and more spacious than it was prior to uh, the COVID-19 experience. So, so they're, they're, they need more space in offices to have uh, the same number of, of people that they had before. But I think, I think Matteo, um, there's going to be a balance here. The, 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 the savings are too, um, are, are too attractive to uh, most companies, particularly having gone through the challenges that we've gone through in the business world. So I think that there will be uh, companies that will, uh, will, will, will take this balance of, 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 of home office mixed with um, actual workspace in the office uh, and, do, and do a bit of, bit of both. I do also think that for young people, that's, we were talking uh, to the Dean earlier about um, about how the, the, the first year students are coming back first. I think this is true. Imagine first year employees that haven't met their boss yet, haven't had you know, face to face with their team that, they're, that, that they're, they're working with. I think the younger executives will benefit most from this physical interaction with one another. Uh, and it's important to bring them into the culture of the company in that environment, as opposed to just another uh, daily Zoom meeting. So, so I, I, I think it'll be a balance, but uh, probably not dissimilar from how uh, Columbia University is, is responding to this challenge. Uh, but I think uh, you'll see both a combination of uh, in-office and in-home work being done in the future. Uh, I agree 100% with you, Terry. I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from these times. I think they taught us how we can be more efficient, how we can be more flexible and, and provide the, the, the right uh, flexibility and work family balance for people so they can have that work in the office, out of the office and, and be as productive or more. But it's very difficult to replace that human interaction. And uh, a lot of what we do is really working with people. It's uh, uh, it, it, it's about team play, it's about leadership, and it's just very difficult to do the right thing uh, without ever speaking with somebody. Having that tough conversation, having that, that feedback where you can really make a really difference and in, 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 in have an impact on the people you work with. I think that's, that, that's going to be very difficult to replace, and uh, we're going to lose uh, a, a lot of opportunities 
if we don't have some of the physical interaction going forward as well. Uh, agree 100%. I was on a call uh, last week with 30 of uh, my, my friends, uh, CEOs, uh, group we call the CEO Roundtable. And we were talking about the return to work idea as one of the segments of our conversation. And we they had a survey basically. We had we asked the CEOs to do it, get, get some you know, uh, survey, and that's not technical or formal, of what do, what do their employees want? You know, we're 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 staying up high here and, and and saying this is what we think you should do, but what do our employees actually want? And and the answer was uh, about a third of them said, I can't wait to get to the office. I mean, I'm dying to get to the office. And that could be a combination of this, these young individuals who want to come back and interact with their team and learn the culture for the first time, or people who just wanted to get out of the house, you know, and just dying to get back uh, into the office environment. A third of them said, no way. I mean, I, I've now have, have uh, concluded that working from home is the answer for me and for my family. It's a great way to get this work-life balance in, in check. And I, I like it. And I want to I want to keep it as long as I, as I possibly can. And then the other third said, I really am undecided on this. <laughs> I'm not sure which way I want to go. I'm just going to sit back and, and wait to see how it goes. That's not dissimilar from a lot of responses we get when we do broad broad surveys on subjects such as uh, it might be such subjects like this but I thought it was telling in that to a person the CEOs were all going that yeah, that's what we're hearing yep I mean it's it's a it's really an individual uh, sense about whether I want to come back right away or, or, or not so I think it's very important at the end of the day that we ask the employees what do they want and what do they prefer and try to work around with their preferences obviously and hope that it works for the company uh, preferences as well look speaking about leadership and we're on this topic Terry I mean you're an example for all of us in the retail industry of leadership uh, you were chairman and CEO for a very long time of the largest fashion company in the world at Macy's. And you had a, an amazing career starting uh, as I think the first job at Federated and uh, uh, having a lot of different jobs, growing through the ranks. I think you, you had uh, a, a short stint outside the company, but then you came back and, uh, and then were chairman and CEO for a very long time. I, I like to get your thoughts and maybe you have some advice for, 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 for our, uh, our audience. Uh, was there one moment or, 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 or one decision that really had a huge impact in you to get into where you were able to get to and that really made a, made, made a, made a huge change for your career and for your progression? Yes, well, um, by the way, that short stint was, I was a CEO of Neiman Marcus for six years, so in between. And, uh, and I learned a lot then and it was, a, things were going great and so making a decision to actually leave and go back to federated because of the the size of the prize you know in terms of the opportunity to do a much much larger scale was attractive but as far as a single decision you know there were there there are so many along the way of uh, of, uh, of a long career that you that you make that you think this is the the most important one i've ever made but when i reflect back on my career I was, I was named the CEO of, of, of what was called Federated Department Stores. We later changed the name to, to Macy's Inc. Um, in 2003. And then in 2004, I became the chairman and CEO. So um, the chairman, former chairman had retired and, and, I, and I took over. So it was just a transition year. And about two months after that, my, the former chairman and CEO had retired and I was in the job, I said to the board of directors, two months now, chairman and CEO, uh, I'd, I'd like to buy Marshall Fields. And I, I thought I, we're, we're doing the work on this and, uh, and it was owned by Target at the time. And, um, and so I said, well, I'd like to buy Marshall Fields. And you know, the board like looked at me with their eyes popping out of their head. Like we hadn't bought a company since the May company in, you know, in nine years ago or since uh, Macy's, we bought Macy's, Federal bought Macy's nine years ago. And so we hadn't done a, a significant acquisition since then. All of a sudden here I'm, two, I'm, I'm, I'm a minute into the job and want to want to make an acquisition. And so uh, we went through all of the work, board was very patient with me. 
And because we didn't have this real estate in the middle of the country, notably Chicago, Minneapolis, Detroit, and the states around them, um, where they had the concentration of, of 60 stores. And, and I wanted stores in that, that area. And I had a vision of changing the names eventually if, that, if, it, if the consumer wanted it to be to Macy's and having the first national fashion retail department. Because we were only in the East Coast and the West Coast at that point at Macy's. And so I, uh, we did all the math. We went through the research. I'll never forget. I, got, I, I, call, I, I made my bid. It, Goldman Sachs was the, uh, was the banker on, on, targets, on target side. And I called, the, I called the, the banker who was a person I've dealt with before and know him very well. Named Jack Levy. I said, Jack, um, here's my offer. And I, I sent it to him uh, and, and he, he looked at it and he said, Terry, thank you for stepping up. That's a, that's a, that's a very powerful offer. Uh, and um, I will get back to you as soon as I hear from the other uh, bidder. And there were only two bidders, May Company and Federated, uh, bidding because of the size of this, this purchase. There, we, we were the only ones who could really scale it. And so so he called me back in about an hour and he said, Terry, was that your best and final offer? And so right then I knew that I got, I got outbid. And, and I said, uh, because of the blind bid. And I said, uh, how big is the delta between my bid and the one you've just received? And he said, well, let me just say it this way. It took my breath away. And I said, in that case, I'm out. And I knew that the May Company overpaid for Marshall Fields when I heard that line. So I hung up the phone, I called my board of directors as we had already scheduled a call and said, we're out and here's the, here's the scenario, here's what happened. And you should all sleep well tonight because I'm going to sleep well tonight because we did not overpay for this property. And I've seen this movie too many times in my career where where highly leveraged retailers end up performing poorly because they don't have the financial wherewithal and balance sheet to attack and to be on the offense. I've seen it too many times, it's not gonna be us. We're not gonna overpay for this property. And the board was very, very appreciative of our analysis. I wasn't emotional about it. I really wanted this property very badly. These stores were fantastic stores, fantastic company, but I wasn't emotional about it. It was data driven. And, and, and the long story short, Mateo, is walking away from that decision gave me the credibility with my board of directors that I needed less than one year later when I actually bought the May Company who bought Marshall Fields. And that was really important because had we not gone through that step before, uh, me again, a young CEO coming up a short time into the job, now only a year as chairman and CEO, asking to buy an $11 billion, make an $11 billion acquisition plus some debt, um, would, would have been a, a bit of a risky move, a very risky move. But the, the value that we, we all learned in that process was that we were not going to overpay, we were going to be disciplined. And the May company ended up letting go of their CEO because it took the board a year. Of course, of course they can't be into the finite details that, that, that the management is into, but over time they did their due diligence, they did their job and they actually made the decision to let that CEO uh, go. So, so because he had clearly paid too much for Marshall Fields. That opened the door. As Soon as I heard that, that announcement, I got on the phone. I called the lead director of the, of the May company. I said, I'd like to have a conversation. He put me in touch with, uh, with a management member, long story short, within probably uh, 30 days, we had made a deal. That's amazing and, and a real lesson in you know, how careful you need to be with m and in our industry. Of course, M&A, a great value creator in certain circumstances, but can also really bounce against you and destroy a lot of value. And unfortunately, when the times get, get tough, like, like nowadays, uh, we've seen a lot of these deals really gone sour. So great, great lessons there, Terry. You know, sometimes the best decision is, uh, is just not make a decision or, or, or just wait and not do anything. 
and, and wait for the right times and, and be patient. No so. question. And you know, the best part of that is, is within a year, we were able to, we bought it for 11 billion. We, within a year, we were able to sell eight and a half billion dollars worth of assets and still get all of the stores, uh, 400 department stores across the country, fill in all the 45 states, the rest of the 45 states that we needed. And, um, and, and we basically paid net less for the May company with their 400 stores than May company paid for Marshall Fields. So it really, you know, was a great, great lesson for me. And I talked to my, my own employees about it over and over again to make sure we never make that mistake. We never overpay and we never want to be a highly leveraged retailer. It's a hard business with uh, even when you're not leveraged, but when you are, it's you're going through times like this, it's almost impossible. Look, Terry, reflect, and this was a, a, extremely helpful and, and a great learning. And as in your career, as you said, this was a decision really make a great impact for you in, in, in your progression, giving you that credibility with the board. Uh, if you want to give an advice to our audience, I'm sure you have seen throughout uh, your career, a lot of greatly talented uh, uh, people that then could never live up to their potential. Was there something, some mistake that they've done, something that you think uh, people need to look to, to avoid in order to avoid these kind of uh, mistakes? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Uh, the, you know, the first, Matteo, is to never think that you have all of the answers. There's always someone who's either smarter than you or, or, or more capable on a certain subject, more knowledge about a category that you're working through. And having the courage to admit that that person may be more capable of coming up with the right answer than you by yourself is a mandatory step for a successful CEO. So I really valued the people that I surrounded myself with. And honestly, I think the, the, I owe whatever success I had at Neiman Marcus or at, or at Federated Macy's was due to the very talented and capable people that I surrounded myself with, who in turn surrounded themselves with talented people. And I never made a decision, a big decision by myself. I always brought in, a, you know, I couldn't bring in everyone obviously for big decisions like buying and ac making acquisition of a May company or something like that. But, but I would use my board of directors. I would use my friends who are CEOs as sounding boards. And I would use my own executives who are experts in the various categories and get their advice and get their input. Sometimes I would disagree, but if I don't have that input to begin with, I, I could get blindsided by not having the full picture in front of me. So critical to success is don't believe you're the smartest person in the room and that you've got all the answers. Surround yourself with really talented, smart, capable people and use them, ask them questions, get their advice. That's another great lesson for sure. Terry, so I think we may want to open it up for questions for our audience. Great. Uh, I think we have, a, we have a great audience and I'm sure there's a lot of uh, interesting questions that people have. So love to leave a little bit of time for them so that we can answer. Exactly, let's do it. Naomi, maybe you want to take it here? Yes, I'll take over. Thank you both so much. Um, and I will, we have quite a few in active chat box. Um, first, I'll give everyone a quick second. If anyone wants to do, use the raise their hand feature, we can start there. But if not, we'll just jump into this these questions here. So um, I'm not seeing any, but if you want to, you can. So I'll start off with this. So how do you think technology will impact the retail industry? And more specifically, how do you see, how do you think virtual reality and augmented reality techniques are going to bring uh, newness and innovation into the retail space in the future? Mateo, by the way, th these questions, Mateo, are for you as well as me. So yeah. I want to <laughs> make sure you are jumping right in here, but I'll, I'll start uh, on this one. And, and first of all, I think, uh, technology has already had a had a major imp impact. In my my own experience, um, during my my tenure, we, Macy's was the uh, fourth largest online retailer in uh, America after Amazon, Apple, and Walmart. So we were hugely penetrated uh, and um, had a very strong and successful 
uh, on, online business in the very, and it was very early days as well. We started it in 1994. So, so uh, what advancements took place in our fulfillment capability was extraordinary. Uh, and to the point where the last three facilities we built, which were approximately 1.1 million square feet on one level, which by the way, when you build a building of that size on one floor, you have to take in consideration the curvature of the earth when you're pouring the concrete. So is that, that's the scale of these, these fulfillment centers. The, the, but the robotics that were used to first identify the, the, the packaging coming in, unpack the box, uh, sort it, and place it in the right bin for the consumer from the time we started to the, to the time I left was extraordinary in terms of speed and efficiency. The technology has advanced in an incredible way and much of that you don't see as a, as a consumer. Um, let me ask uh, Matteo to talk about, about um, augmented reality and virtual reality and how that's benefiting uh, retail. So I think this is a great topic and I, I think uh, there's been a lot of studies and tests on different categories on this subject. I think the augmented reality is already something that's very important in certain categories like furniture. Yeah. We have seen a lot of retailers having a, a, a technology experience where you can kind of see what your, 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 your home living room may be with the new furniture and there's kind of a renderings and an augmented reality that you can see that. So uh, already a lot of progress in certain of these categories. On others, I think uh, we still haven't made as much progress, uh, whether that it's uh, for apparel, I think uh, we're a little bit in the earlier stages regarding that. But I think it will become more and more important. One, one thing that we have seen uh, uh, an impact is on virtual fitting. Virtual fitting has been uh, very, very important and uh, a lot of people are gonna be able to find the way to try the right garments of their size and get them to their home by, by doing kind of a virtual fitting experience. And that's been quite successful. And I think uh, as we go forward, more of these tests will, will, will be tried. And I think uh, we'll see in which categories they're more successful. Thank you. Um, we do have a raised hand and I apologies in advance if I don't pronounce this correctly. Uh, Zorong Go, you had a question? wrong and you might need to unmute oh there you go uh, hello hi uh, hi uh hi terry you know uh and mateo thanks for sharing and then you know uh, I'm, I'm just a master student i just joined columbia business school and started in the fall and i really learned a lot you know uh from your from your sharing and i and you know in terms of advice and you just mentioned that you know about success about you know how to listen to others advice but I also have a question that I want to ask you. So, you know, uh, with with the advancement of online, you know, with these technologies and online retail, and how do you, and how do you persuade your board of directors or your, you know, associates to move forward when you see a trend like this, you know, especially with, uh, you know, uh, especially with all these uh, new things happening, and how do you, you know, at your time as CEO, how do you constantly adapting to the new environment? And most importantly, how do you persuade others to follow your lead? Well, I'll start. Um, thank you for your question. I, 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 first of all, the, the, the answer to, to me is you just start with data. And so uh, when you see these, these trends, you, you quickly you know, search to discover what are the best sources for satisfying those, those trends, whether it be product or technology, uh, and then you come to your, your conclusions about executing against that. You know, the, a board of directors will, they're not into the cornflakes, if you will, the, de the little, little details, nor should they be, since they, they meet every two months. Uh, in, you know, they, they read materials, but they meet physically or now virtually, as I'm doing, every, every two months. So they're not in the day-to-day -day, um, you know, network of, the, of what the decisions that are being made by the, by the company. But, but others are, and, and so I'm constantly, you know, with the board of directors will, will uh, approve, as an example, a total capital budget. And so in the case of, 
of, of Macy's and Bloomingdale's and Blue Mercury, we were spending you know, between 850 and a billion dollars a year on capital improvements. And, but, but they didn't get into the details of how we would spend that. We would decide. So I could change gears if I saw trends happening that suggested I needed more investment you know, in, in robotic equipment for fulfillment centers and, and I could take it away from a, of an upgraded, you know, furnishing, refurnishing improvement of a physical store if, if, if I thought that that was critically important for the, for the business at that time. So a lot of those, you're making those decisions. You know, your team are, are, are making, making those decisions. And as far as the team is, is concerned, which is very, very important, I basically had a, had a policy, and I, Naomi might know about this, but, but I would invite my people in to, give, to share their feedback and to give me their, their, their insights. And when I sensed that somebody wasn't, you know, on board, but wasn't act, actively, you know, uh, discussing it, their view, I would seek them out and I would go find out what's, you know, you didn't seem like you were on board with this. Tell me why. And well, and then I would get a one-on-one, -on -one, I would get a, a pushback and I'd say, okay, great. And by the way, sometimes I'd say, you know what, you make a good point. I need to alter my strategy here based on your input. Other times I would say, well, I hear what you're saying, um, but here's why we're going to go this way anyway, because I feel passionately that I've taken that into consideration and we're, we, we still need to move forward here. And it is a risk, but I believe it's the right decision and we're gonna go forward. Are you with me? You know, And I, and I would always leak, make sure I left her room with a nod at least that they were with me. And to the credit of my team, I don't recall ever having a situation when we had those conversations that we didn't walk out of that room arm in arm as if it was the other person's idea, not mine. And, and I, that's, the kind, that's what you need in terms of having the strong, talented people around you. You want the pushback. You want them to, to, to guide you if you're making a bad decision. But at the end of the day, when a decision is made, you want them at, as acting as if it's their decision. And I feel like that in kind of engagement was very helpful to, uh, to the company in making decisions and communicating them as one. Terry, I definitely uh, said, oh, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. I definitely sat in on a few round tables myself and I hope, and I, what I appreciated most is that our insights were taken into consideration and in many times executed. And even at the intern level, people were always looking and listening. So I felt that all the way over at Bloomingdale's. Great, glad to hear that. But this uh, reflects completely my experience, Terry. I think uh, uh, it's the, 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 the right uh, way the people follow is uh, you make feel they're, they're being heard. They're the ones that are making the suggestion. They're the ones that are making the decision. The leader is not the real one that makes the decision. The leader is the one that lets the others make the decision. And that's how you get followership in my experience. I agree hundred percent. I had a uh, sign Matteo in my office for several years. Uh, first of all, the sign outside my door didn't say chief executive officer. It said chief customer officer. Cause I always try to remember who we're serving and and I had a sign in my in, on the wall in my, in my in my office that was a quote that said, uh, "There is no limit to what you can accomplish as long as you don't care who gets the credit." And and I remember specific examples of me having this idea and bringing it to you know a group of of, of people, and then you know a, a month later being in a in a meeting and this person's talking about their idea that. I thought it was my idea, but it's now come their idea. And, and I said, I'm like, fantastic. What a great idea you have. Let's do that. That's great. And so it, it doesn't matter to me, but now they're going to, they're going to be, be so, you know, uh, focused on executing that idea because they do in fact now believe that it's theirs. And so that to me is the ultimate uh, opportunity for great execution. I hundred percent agree. Well, thank you both. We are actually just at about time. And so uh, we have a number of questions and maybe I'll be able to send them to you privately, uh, Terry, so you can yes. kind of look over and get back to the respondents. Um, but 
I definitely want to thank you both. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Mateo, for a great discussion. Um, thank you all for attending tonight's session of the Leadership Speaker Series. We look forward to seeing you for the next session of the series on Monday, August 24th at 8 p.m. when we will hear, when we will hear from Gail McGovern of Class of 87, President and CEO of the American Red Cross. But for now, we wish everyone a, a great night. Um, if you're anywhere near the storm, stay safe. Um, but until then, until next time, take care of yourselves. Best of luck, everyone. Thank you very much.